Hi, this is Andre. Stephen Clements is one of my Patreon supporters, and he asked me to do a video talking about getting the audio from the Echoplex into a recorded form. Um, so this is going to be a bit of a different video for me. I'm actually doing screen capture, as you can see, and I'm going to be going through some of the technical geeky details of how I record the EDP, what I do to the EDP after I've recorded it to try and get it to sound the way I want it to, um, and various mixing and production related things. I'm also probably going to go into some rants and philosophical bits of me being the old man yelling at the cloud, telling the kids to get off my lawn. Uh, so I'm sure we will all look forward to that. Um, to start with, let's address one of the elephants in the room with the EDP, which is that it doesn't save audio. Um, it doesn't save audio. It's totally a drag in a lot of ways. There have been times when I have come up with loops that I would have liked to have saved, and they were just lost to the mists of time because I didn't have a recording device there, and I didn't have any way to store it. So it's a drag. It can be a drag. It is a drag. I totally get that. Um, the flip side, I guess I would say, is that maybe because of that, um, I've tended to kind of think conceptually about loops being less of a specific repeating musical end point and more of a technical starting point. Um, so it's not so much about getting this one fixed loop that you can point to and say, here's this fragment of sound that repeats over and over again. For me, the loop, uh, in and of itself is, is more about thinking of it as this kind of ongoing technical apparatus. And as it's repeating, you can do all kinds of stuff to it to cut and paste it and evolve the texture, which is where something like this comes in. This is the DAW, Digital Audio Workstation, that I use. It's Logic Audio. I also use Ableton Live sometimes. But for more straight ahead recording, I like using Logic. Um, and the second thing we should address, the second elephant in the room with the EDP, is that it's a mono signal. And here again, you know, for me, that's not such a big deal because I loop the electric guitar and my conception of the guitar is such that it's not generally this super highly processed thing with tons of stereo imaging. And if it is, that's usually happening after the fact in mixing or, or that sort of thing. Um, and if I'm doing stereo imaging with the, with looping, it's almost certainly post-processing the, the EDP with some kind of stereo effect like lexicon vortex or a chaos pad. And with all that said, I also get it. There are a lot of people who need to loop a stereo signal. So it's a drag. I understand that. Um, so we're also going to address the stereo issue because there's a variety of different techniques that I've kind of cultivated over the years to give some stereo imaging to the EDP after it's been recorded. So to start with, let's take a listen to the EDP as it was originally recorded. This is a jam from the loop windowing video from a couple of months ago. This is just the bare Echoplex audio in its most basic sense. Let's check that out. So that's what the EDP sounds like in its most basic, unadulterated form. There's no kind of processing happening at all. Um, that's just the sound that comes straight out of the EDP. Now, once it is inside the computer, there's a few different things I do. And one of the first is actually apply some noise reduction. It's not a super noisy signal. And if you actually have a listen here, you can see on the screen right now, there's a bit of a gap in the original performance. That was when I realized I didn't have the camera running. So right when this gap begins here, I paused the EDP and turned on the camera and then went back and restarted the EDP. So right there, you can hear some background noise, or maybe we can't. Let's see. So that was it. You know, if you're listening on headphones, you'll probably hear it more more uh, clearly. Uh, not a ton of noise, but 
for whatever reason, I'm in a period right now where I like getting rid of that noise if I can. I'm just not crazy about hearing it. Another thing is that I found, and I, I was encountering this all the way back in 2002 when I was recording an album called Normalized. One of the things I realized is that there's certain types of background noise that you don't necessarily notice by themselves, but when you do some of the things I like to do to get the stuff to sound like the final mixed mastered product, uh, some of that background noise can start getting in the way, and things that might not be very noticeable in an unadulterated sense, if you're just listening to the track by itself, can start to get compounded when you start adding more things in the mixing. So I do like to denoise a little bit. Um, so what we're going to do here is this top waveform is the raw unadulterated signal. The second waveform is the denoise signal. So let's do a little bit of comparative listening here. Let me play the undenoise signal first, and then I'll play the denoise signal after. So not a huge night and day difference in my opinion. Some of the noise comes from the EDP, some of it comes from my sound card. I have a bit of a rat's nest for my recording setup here at home. So it's not the cleanest audio signal path it could possibly be. Uh, and it's not the sort of thing you're necessarily going to notice unless you're really looking for it. But like I say, part of it is just me kind of being a nut about it and not wanting to hear noise if I can possibly get rid of it. And part of it is that my experience has been that that kind of noise can cause more problems down the road once I start doing such the signal. I use Isotope RX software to denoise, uh, which is amazing. So my friend Ross Guerin once said that it kind of feels like cheating when you use it because it's so easy to get rid of undesirable sounds. Anyway, that's my, uh, that's my sponsorship pitch for Isotope. Love you guys. Um, there will be another Isotope sponsorship pitch soon. So let's look at some of what actually happens as far as those audio effects. Um, I'm going to play the denoised version. So the top one is the undenoised version. We're not going to worry about that anymore because we've heard that. And calling up the denoised version, one of the first things that I do is send this to a couple of external sends. I send it to sends. Isn't that clever? Uh, I'm going to isolate the channel here. Let me open up the mixer window on Logic. There we go. So this is. Where are we? This is the channel for the denoised echoplex signal. And as you can see, it's got a couple of effect sends. And, and if you're not familiar with audio mixing, this basically means that you can take the signal and send it to another channel where you can do different stuff to it. And when I was recording an album called Normalized back in 02, I was mixing it in 03, um, I, it took quite a while and I, I gradually developed a, a basic strategy for how I could get the EDP recording sounding kind of the way I wanted it to, you know, so that it, it kind of had a certain depth and fullness and impact, really. Um, so there's two things that I mainly do to it. Uh, the first is I give it stereo imaging. And what you can do is find a plugin that does, it basically synthesizes stereo from a mono, mono source. So I'm going to play it just in its unadulterated mono state. So that's just the pure mono of the EDP. Now I'm going to activate one of the bus sends, which is sending it to a stereo effect. And let's check out how that sounds different. So especially if you're listening on headphones, you can really hear suddenly there's a three-dimensionality to the sound. Let me call up that auxiliary channel, and let's look a little in more detail at what's going on. The main thing is the isotope ozone imager. I told you there would be more isotope content. Uh, this is basically a free plugin, and what this does is takes a mono signal and synthesizes it into stereo. So what I'm going to do is play the track. I'm going to set all the settings to pure mono, and then as I gradually kick it in, you will hear some other things that happen. 
So, blah, blah, blah. So that's the setting on isotope ozone imager that I end up using. Um, this is cranked up all the way. It's also a free plugin, um, and I love it. I've used a few different types of stereo imaging plugins throughout the years. This one seems to work at least as well as the others. I haven't done a lot of hard and fast A-Bing, to be honest. Um, I have found that it's, for whatever reason, I don't find myself obsessing over this one as much as I do some of the other plugins. Maybe that's just because they deliberately limit the controls. You basically have two controls you can adjust. And for better or worse, I often find myself being the kind of person where if I have additional parameters I can tweak, then I tend to tweak them. And if the parameters aren't there, then I don't really miss them, to be completely honest. Uh, there are other imaging plugins that I've used to get stereo imaging. Uh, and to be honest, I still haven't done a strict A-B comparison. I started using the Isotope Imager when I started making the tutorial videos back in October, November of 2017. I really like the way it sounded. I still like the way it sounds. One thing I do in addition is do some widening of the stereo image, and I also do some frequency cutting. And specifically, what I'm going to do here is play you a couple of versions. I'm going to play the way it normally sounds, and then I'm going to disable these plugins. I'm going to disable side pass and two instances of wider. These are the side pass and wider are both plugins by a fantastic plugin developer named Chris Johnson who releases stuff as air windows. So first, you're going to hear it with the air windows plugins engaged, and then I'm going to cut them out, and you'll hear how it changes things. <laughs> So side pass is basically cutting the bass frequencies in the far stereo field. And I don't want to go into a big talk about this, largely because I don't know a whole lot about the subject and can't speak meaningfully about it. But long story short is that a lot of the recordings we are accustomed to hearing have the bass frequencies largely in mono. In other words, if you listen to a lot of albums, a lot of the really low frequencies are going to tend to be focused in mono. What side pass does is cut the bass frequencies mainly just on the the far side parts of the the stereo channel i have it set about halfway here um and the idea there is that you can get a signal that doesn't have a lot of bass in the far left and right stereo field let me play this again and i will adjust side pass while i do that So getting it in dialed about halfway is where I generally like it. The other Air Windows plugin I'm using on this auxiliary channel is called Wider, and that exaggerates the stereo field. I have two instances because I wanted a little, a little more of an extreme setting. And as I was engaging the different instances of Wider, as I was kicking them in and out, you could hear, especially on headphones, that the stereo image changed. Um, how wide of an image you want is kind of a matter of taste. Uh, I personally tend to like stuff that's a little more exaggerated, uh, and I really like the way that sounds, which is why I'm using two instances in place. So that's kind of what we're doing on that first auxiliary bus send. There's a second auxiliary bus send that I'm using, and I'm specifically using that to synthesize more bass and low-end frequencies under the guitar. Um, there's a lot of different plugins that do this kind of thing. I've used different plugins over the years. The one that I used on this particular project is the uh, Waves Renaissance Bass.
plugin. Um, I use that because I got it for free a few years ago. I think it was a Black Friday freebie for 24 hours. <clears throat> so no wave sponsorship for me. And it sounds great. Let me just isolate that audio send so you can hear it with and without the Renaissance bass plugin. So it's not like a massive subwoofer melting bass sound, but it kind of fills in the gaps. One of the things I found that tends to make a recording sound finished or quote unquote polished or professional is kind of filling in the high end and the low end in certain ways that are not necessarily obvious and you don't necessarily hear the recording and say, oh my God, there's all this high and low end that's been filled in. It doesn't beat you over the head like that, but if it's not there, then we can tend to hear that something is missing. You can kind of hear it and, and feel like, yeah, that feels a little small or boxy or that doesn't quite sound the way we're accustomed to hearing recording sound. Uh, part of this is just my arrogant stubbornness because I want my recordings as much as possible to try and compete, quote unquote, with a full band production or a full EDM or hip hop production. Um, yes, I'm making it on a solid body or chambered electric guitar. And there's going to be limitations in that, um, but I want to try and flatter the sound as much as possible. So it's kind of a subjective thing. You know, there's some people would say that what I'm doing is completely transforming the sound. Um, and they're not wrong because I am doing a lot to embellish and boost the sound. I guess what I would say is that any sound that you hear on pretty much any recording has gone through some kind of embellishment, whether it's the type of microphone that was used the type of preamp that was used, the type of equalization that was applied to the sound, the mixing console, the software, whether it was recorded to tape, what the sampling frequency and bit depth was used. And especially if you talk about like big budget professional recordings, there's a lot of stuff that goes into a sound. You know, they don't just throw a mic in front of somebody's voice and record it and that's the end of the story. There are a lot of intermediate steps that go in there. So a lot of the plugins I'm using and a lot of the production steps I'm doing with this stuff is basically doing that. You know, it's, it's kind of filling in the gap and trying to get my solo mono echoplex looping performances sounding a little more full and a little bigger. And for lack of a less uh, horrifying way of describing it, a little more competitive so that you can listen to it and hopefully not feel like something is really missing. If you go from listening to this to listening to you know, a, a hip hop album or an EDM album or a funk album. Um, I'm not saying that it totally competes in any way with, you know, any particular thing you want to list, but that's, you know, that's kind of my attempt. That's where a lot of this stuff is coming from, just to try and flatter the sound as much as possible and give it as nice of, as nice of a presentation as I can while still maintaining the integrity of the sound. So if we look now at the master bus, the master output channel. We have a few different plugins going on there. Um, I'm going to, what am I going to do? I'm going to look at each one of them. Um, we have Grooveware, which is another Aero Windows plugin that this is basically designed to emulate the frequency response of a recording coming back off of vinyl. Um, so I'm going to do an AB comparison with Grooveware in and then out. not a huge difference, but it has a bit of a high frequency, uh, high frequency boost to it that I really like. There's also one right before that, the Q3D, which is a high frequency boost. It's an EQ, but I particularly use it for its high frequency boost. Let's compare that with and without.
I have a really subtle setting on the on the Q3D. Let's see what's actually going on. Yeah, so there's a bit of an air boost, which is the super high frequencies, and there's a bit of a sub bass boost going on there too. Um, not something again that leaps out at you and beats you over the head with its presence, but it does make a subtle difference. Let's take a look at some of the other effects that are on the master output bus. We have Kotelnikov by Tokyo Dawn Records, which is a very tweakable compressor. Let's listen to a little bit of that with and without. <laughs> The next one after that is Tone Booster's Real Bus, which is an analog tape simulator. There's something kind of crazy about using a digital computer in 2018 and using plugins to make it sound like you're recording to real or real tape. I get that. I also love the way it sounds. So let's hear a little bit of that. The next plugin is the PSP Vintage Warmer, and this goes back at least to 2002, 2003, because I actually used the first version. This is the Vintage Warmer 2. I actually used the first version of the Vintage Warmer on Normalized, which I mixed in 2003. So for a plugin to be around that long is kind of insane. Um, and it sounds great. It's, again, very subtle. I'm going to do a bit of an A-B back and forth so you can hear it with and without the Vintage Warmer. That is really subtle. Um, a lot of it is also a cumulative thing, and when I'm done going through these individually, I will turn them all on and you can kind of hear the back and forth difference. The next one after that is Spiral, which is another Era Windows plugin. This is a pretty recent one. This is basically designed to emulate uh, an analog kind of frequency response. I'm not going to pretend that I understand the full details of what Chris Johnson does, because he's kind of a mad scientist in the best possible sense. Uh, this is another super subtle plugin. I'm mainly using it here as kind of a peak limiter, just to keep the, uh, the sound from going over zero dB. I'm, I don't think we're going to hear much of a difference, but let's see. I honestly don't. Let's find out. That is damn subtle. Uh, and finally, we have yet another Air Windows plugin called Not Just Another Dither, which has to do with dithering the audio for 24 bit output. Um, it's an incredibly subtle thing. I don't really claim to hear dither very well, but a lot of people swear by it. A lot of people say you should dither audio. Um, doesn't seem to hurt the audio, and I'm sure it's helping on some level. So now that we've gone through all that, I'm going to engage all of the plugins on the master channel one at a time so we can hear the cumulative effect. So there's an old joke that says that every hairdresser knows that it takes at least an hour to achieve the natural look. And I always think about that when I'm doing mixing and production for audio. The things that we're accustomed to hearing as like normal, regular sounds oftentimes are the result of going through a lot of processing and a lot of stuff happening behind the scenes that we're not necessarily consciously aware of as listeners. We just hear it and we don't say, wow, listen to all those different things that the signal flow went through. 
we don't hear it as that. We just hear it as, okay, that's what a regular sound or a good sound is supposed to be. One thing I should also point out is that the type of signal chain we've been talking about in this video is not something I use for the regular tutorial videos. For the videos, I generally just use the denoising and the ozone imager to give a bit of stereo placement. And that's about it. I don't do a big uh, song and dance production on the guitars when I'm doing the tutorial videos. What we've been looking at here is the signal path that I used for Six String Mixtape Volume 2, which came out a month or so back. I'm recording this in July 2018. Uh, it's a similar but slightly different arrangement to what I used on the first volume of the Six String Mixtape. It was the same general approach, but using different effects. Uh, which in itself was similar to other recordings I've put out, and I'm sure future recordings will follow a similar template, but also use different plugins, depending on what sounds good to me at that time and how I continue to hopefully grow and improve as an engineer and a producer. In any event, thank you very much to Stephen Clements for commissioning this, and thank you for tuning in. Um, I know this was kind of a different video, so I hope it wasn't too ranty and meandering. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in, as always. I will talk to you guys soon. Bye-bye.